Now we're going to take a look at logic and sets. And really, these early chapters are probably the toughest chapters and the most challenging chapters because they are not procedural. When we teach math, we teach it procedural in a lot of ways. And when we do things as procedural, it's easier for people to understand what's being done. However, when we are abstract, like we are in these first few sections, it can definitely be more of a challenge because we're just giving you guidelines on how to think. So if I look at reasoning and logic, I just want to introduce this topic to you. And I look at students want to be able to under, understand and explain the effects on statements. So I want to quantify something and see its effect. I want to have different forms of statements. I want to be able to say things differently. I want to know how to determine if two statements are equivalent. I want to know how to develop logical arguments and how to determine whether an argument is valid. Here, I have some definitions I want to go over. A statement is a sentence that is either true or false, but it cannot be both. A negation is making a true statement false, which is making a negation. So if I want to negate each of the following, 2 plus 3 equals 5, to negate that, I would say 2 plus 3 is not equal to 5. So I'm negating it. A hexagon has six sides. A hexagon does not have six sides. So I'm just adding in that negative word there. A quantifier would be words that quantify an amount, all, some, every. A universal qualifier, quantifier would be all, every, none. Existential quantifiers are going to be one or possibly every element in a set. So some, it's more general, some, at least one, um, various, where it's not all, it's not none, but it's somewhere in between that spectrum. So if I want to say all students like hamburgers, to negate that, I wouldn't say not all students. I would say some because I'm taking a universal word and I'm making it more general. Some people like mathematics, no people like mathematics. So it's almost like you're taking it down. If it's all, you're gonna go down to some. If it's some, you're gonna go down to none. That's how that process is gonna work. If I wanna get this statement, there exists a natural number such that that, then I would say for all natural numbers, three n does not equal six. For all natural numbers, then I would say there exists a natural number. So I'm going from all to some. I'm going from some to none. But this is affecting the second part of the statement. I can do this in a symbolic truth table. A symbolic truth table allows us to show what is possible and then the negation of each thing. A compound statement might want to, multiple things to be true. We're going to connect those statements with something like and. So we would use, um, that's not there. Okay, so and is going to be the upside down U, um, which is not showing up there in the PowerPoint. But a, conjunct, a conjunction is true only if both statements are true because we're using that and. If one of them is not true, then the whole thing is false, which is what this is showing over here. A disjunction is a compound statement created from two given statements with the connective or. So I can be either or here, which means that it could be true if they're both true or if only one of them is true. Here are some examples. P and Q. So I would want to know if P and Q are both going to be true. P is true because 2 plus 3 is 5. Q is true. So P and Q is true. If I look at Q and R, that's an or, which is going to be an upright U. Q is true and R is false, so that that is true because I just needed one of them to be. Not P and Q and R would be false because not P is false. 5 plus 3 is not 9, so the whole thing is false. So I wish these these conjunctions we're showing here, but this is an and. So if not P would make it false, not Q in this case would be false because 
two times three, then I would know the whole thing is false if it's an and. Here, I'm having P or Q. Oh, P and Q, not P and Q. Okay, so if P and Q is true, then not P and Q is false. Here, I'm going to have P and Q is true and not R is true because five plus, if I say five plus three is not nine, then it becomes true. Then the whole thing is true because all three of them are true. Now, conditionals and biconditionals are going to be an additional layer to this. A conditional is going to be if then. If this, then this. And it's represented with this arrow that goes between them. So a hypothesis would be the if part of the conditional, and the conclusion is what's behind the then. So if I have a statement, if P, then Q, my hypothesis is if P, my conclusion is then Q, and I'm going to use that notation. If I want the converse, I'm going to switch P and Q. So I'm going to say if Q, then P. That's going to be the converse is switching the letters. The inverse means you start with the original statement, if P, then Q, and you make them both negative, not P, then not Q. A contrapositive is where you switch the order of P and Q and you make them both negative. So if it was something like the contrapositive of the last statement, if not Q, then not P, would be if P, then Q, because you're always changing whether you're negating that piece or not. So if I want to take this and write the converse, the inverse, and the contrapositive of if I am in San Francisco, then I am in California. The converse would be if I am in California, then I am in San Francisco. So I swap the order. Because I swap the order here, is, are both statements true? If I am in California, then do you have to be in San Francisco? No. So the converse does not always hold. The inverse would mean you're going to negate both statements. If I am not in San Francisco, then I am not in California. We know that not to be true because you could be in San Francisco and be in California. And then the contrapositive is going to be we're going to flip the order and negate them. So California is going to come to the beginning of the phrase, San Francisco is going to come to the end, and we're going to put a not in front of it. So these are logically equivalent statements. So let's use a truth table to determine if P then Q and not Q then not P. So this is what that table would look like. If P is true, then not P is false. If it's false, then it's true. So that's where this is coming from. If Q is true, then not Q is false. If Q is false, then not true is true. I mean, not false is true. So then if I'm looking at if P, then Q, if they're both true, it's true. If one of them is true, it's false for a conditional. If one of them is false, again, and then if they're both false, then I'm going to have a true going back. These are a lot of um, not as much what we're going to dig into with our younger students. We're mostly looking at those concrete examples of valid reasoning. Something like a hypothesis. All cats like fish. Felix is a cat. Therefore, Felix likes fish. This probably seems more the speed of our younger students. So we want them to work on um, understanding a larger statement and how a larger statement can relate to a specific situation. So we could use this diagram. And so here's my larger statement that cats like fish. And then Felix is this tiny thing because he's just a tiny little subgroup of cats. And he also likes fish. That is a very probable hypothesis and conclusion. Now, if I determine the following argument is valid, in Washington, D.C., all lobbyists have influence. No one in Washington, D.C. over six feet tall has influence. The conclusion here would be that people over six feet tall are not lobbyists if, if all lobbyists have influence. And so we can look at the validity of this reasoning with these diagrams. If L represents the lobbyist and lowercase 
L is the people who have influence, then the first hypothesis is pictured on the left. And W represents the people who are over six feet tall, which would be on the right. Because people over six feet tall are outside of the circle of those lobbyists, then the conclusion is valid that no person over six feet tall is a lobbyist in Washington. This is just a visual representation of it. The law of detachment shows us if P then Q is true, and P is true, then Q is true. So what I'm saying is if, if you are in San Diego, then you are in California. If that's a true statement, and that means P and Q are both true independently. So I would have to be in San Diego, and I'm also in California. So that's a direct reasoning. Here's another example. If it is raining, then the grass is wet. It is raining, if that's true, then I would also conclude the grass is wet. If I'm using indirect reasoning, then if a conditional is accepted as true and the conclusion is false, our hypothesis must be false. If it is raining, the grass is wet. Well, the grass is not wet, which means it didn't rain. So this is just asking you to break down those conclusions. If the statement if P then Q and if Q then R are true, then both P and R are also true, like in the example on the slide. Here's another example, and here's another example with valid conclusions. So you've seen a couple of valid conclusions here. Again, this is really abstract stuff in this unit, and so really work towards digesting the definitions, copying these definitions down somewhere so that you have them, because the challenge is going to be knowing the definition and knowing what to do with the definition on the lab as well as the quiz.